Hey, what's up? I'm the Shaman, and this is a big ass fucking joint. Uh, perfect size for 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, believe it or not, I do have a busy day in front of me, which is why I think I'm a fairly functional stoner. Um, I mean, being stoned is the least of my worries when it comes to functioning. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk. Um, let's get right into it because it's a lot to unpack. Um, uh, the unfortunately short career of Shane Carruth and the like very impactful, immensely profound, um, just just glow that his last film Upstream Colors left me with. Um, I haven't talked about his stuff. Um, kind of deliberately because he's being, you know, cancelled and sounds like while there are kind of grounds as to why he was, or how he was doing shitty things towards his wife who he starred in his last film Upstream Color alongside because she was a documentary filmmaker, he wanted to get um, a perspective from someone who spent their career working on capturing things realistically um as opposed to through the lens of fiction um so she played the role of kind of an advisor as well as co-star in upstream color uh or well i mean she's basically the main character and he's a close second because he always stars in his films um he has a very tragic story behind his downfall um he was just a guy who wanted creative control over his films, and he's a certified genius. I mean, um, his first film, uh, the very amateur looking, because it was just shot on $7,000 uh, primer, um, is, I would, I would say, vies for the number one spot on the most complex. Um, like, you have to be not even just like someone familiar with uh sort of um highbrow filmmaking um you have to be familiar with mathematics with physics like you know he has a degree in mathematics i believe physics um perhaps engineering or something like that but um you know there's a lot of in primer um and i would say primer and upstream color the only two films he's had made um, his other films, A Topiary, which wasn't made, unfortunately, sounds fucking amazing. Um, and, uh, uh, he was going to do another film as well, um, with Daniel Radcliffe, Anne Hathaway, a bunch of big names attached to it. Um, but, you know, he couldn't get creative control, he couldn't get the money. You know, there, I think even told him he had to do a Marvel movie before he wanted to do one of his own. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was just, like, not a fan of adapting other people's material through people's passions. Um, like, um, you know, he does the score, he edits, he directs, he writes, he stars in his movies. Primer is, uh, even though it's a very rigid, technical film that becomes wrapped up in all these convoluted, um, uh, on the surface anyway, seemingly convoluted um, occurrences that transpire throughout the film because it's a time travel movie and it is to me the time travel movie, the time travel story period um, because it, you know, if there's anything you could model a time machine on it'd probably be what he uh, 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 and the other dude in the movie um, who plays Abe um, what they devise, um, and, uh, it's, uh, also something that exposes the limitations and potential hazards of time travel, uh, which is to essentially cause these paradoxical, um, effects in reality, where they are creating new versions of themselves each time, they go back and when they go back it's not like they can go wherever they want they can every second they spend in this box um where everything is reversed essentially like they breathe in nit nitrous oxide as opposed to oxygen 
um, because that's the opposite of oxygen, um, and for every second they're in there, they go back. You know, they're still aging in the box and everything. Um, it's uh, sort of like an insulation from time. But by doing this, they sort of create a closed off time loop. Um, and, uh, you know, they do what anyone would do, really, which is, you know, to, to play the stock market and uh, so on and so forth. But then things take a very interesting twist. But because of the uh, amateurish look to um, Primer, which, you know, I say that um, in the best way possible because it, you know, has that student film appearance because it kind of was their student film. And it is an impressive feat. Um, it still puzzles people to this day. If you search up primer diagrams um, on Google Images, you will see all these diagrams made by um, uh, fans on Reddit to try and figure out the movie, which they haven't. Um, now, Upstream Color, which I just watched, I've seen Primer a couple times already, um, is like the inverse. It is, it can't be more different than um, uh, Primer. Upstream Color is very philosophical, um, very surreal, very unnerving, um, but it's also very beautiful. Um, it's one of those interesting things where it was quite a sleeper hit. Like, I remember I first saw, like, 10 minutes of it on Netflix ages ago. I must have been, like, just like, like, this is, like, the first or second year that Netflix was, like, really a thing. Um, and I watched, like, the first 10 minutes, and I was like, oh, this is pompous art house crap, and I just turned it off. Um, well, I think... In my mind at the time, which was that of a young burgeoning creator, um, I was kind of jealous by how insanely creative what I was seeing on screen was. Um, so I'm glad I turned it off and I saved it for when I was a little bit more uh, developed and a little less prone to just go, oh, this guy's fuck, he's such a competent filmmaker, why can't I be Jake Kemp? You know, that's not a winning attitude. Um, uh, I, I watched it, um, I've been wanting to watch it again uh, over the last week, um, but uh, like I kind of feel like I did get a lot of the first viewing, and it's also one of those films that I don't want to watch so many times that I get sick of it because it it is such a unique movie. Um, I hear people compare it to Terrence Malick's Tree of Life a lot. Personally, um, as much of a fan as I am of uh, Terrence Malick's early stuff, like I have a copy of Badlands, which was uh, an amazing directorial debut. Um, one of his bleaker films. Um, you know, if those of you who are familiar with his movies know he makes very transcendental um, films. Uh, like, you know, really like, whoa, this universe, whoa, creation, whoa, extinction, whoa, I kind of, you know, thing which is, which is cool. Like, uh, when done well, uh, it works, um, and it can be very moving. Um, uh, in a way that to me is oddly similar to the feelings I got from Carl Sagan when he was going off on these poetic, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, diatribes on, uh, on cosmos, you know, the earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. Recently we have waded a little way out and the ocean seems in fact, you know, like, uh, subtle hints of just the, the, the beauty of the universe and um, as someone who is neurochemically uh, biased against that um, because I have trouble finding beauty in the universe a lot of the time, um, I would say a string color, um, probably the most impactful movie in uh, giving me um, like a sense of majesty 
um, in uh, the face of the universe, just this, uh, yeah, there, there really are these crazy intricate phenomenons happening around us all the time, and um, being who I am though, um, like with that DMT trip that made me question um, just how real objective reality is, um, and you know how the paranormal fits into it. Uh, I rationalized the trip away um, about an hour after. Now, um, to me, upstream color. Uh, I mean, hell, even Shane Cruz does the opposite of David Lynch with this film. Where right after its premiere, when people were kind of asking, "Well, what the hell is this about?" Um, there's a lot of very odd events occurring, but the odd uh, uh, players in each sort of phase of this cycle that makes up the movie is um, like it's obvious, like they're they're named like the thief, the sampler, um, and you know like it's it's obvious what happens, but because of the like very ethereal otherworldly uh, uh, nature of the subject matter and the images, um, like, it can be interpreted in many different ways, but Shane Carruth, yeah, he did the opposite of that David Lynch just shut anyone down who tries to ask what anything you're saying through, like, even a single scene, um, means. Uh, I used to think that David Lynch just said that because he wanted people to continue, uh, you know, questioning um, and coming up with uh, their own, uh, you know, derivative outcomes of uh, uh, what the source material is trying to say, um, what it says to them. But I think David Lynch actually just doesn't know what a lot of the stuff he's putting out there means, which is perfectly fine, because I think, you know, uh, even if he doesn't know, I think there is a lot being said subtextually. Um, but uh, Shane Carruth, immediately after the premiere, was like, okay, so this movie is about people who are going through uh, a cycle, and they are trying to find a way to break the cycle, and so this is a movie about people breaking cycles. Now, the cycle in the movie is, um, I'm going to try to get this right, um, so it's not exactly told in chronological order from what I can tell, but it also has this time as a flat circle aspect to it where everything seems to uh, blend together, even if in a linear sense, like some things that are presupposed in the movie, which I'll get into, um, uh, aren't shown to happen until later on. Um, uh, so, you know, that brings up some interesting questions to me about sort of determinism and um which you know is essentially if you think of fate uh like you know just that we are for one reason or another um determined to do x y and z against our will without our agency and with maybe the illusion of agency to, to boot um uh so it's a fucking strong ass duty. Um, I'm gonna have the rest of it in a bit because it is 10 in the morning. Well, probably like 10 15 now, but anyways. Um, so, from what I can tell, there's this guy who's like a godlike figure, and he's, from what I can tell, the most um, influential figure in the narrative. And um, to me, he is like a malicious god, but he, and I think Karuth has hinted at this, he might not know what he's doing, um, in terms of, uh, you know, ethics, which, if you think about God, this, you know, hypothetical, omniscient, omnipotent being, um, there's no way we could ever comprehend the mind of something like that, it would, you know, that, kind of evokes me images of the alien planet of, like, this electric plasma in Solaris that, uh, you know, is there to serve, uh, the novel and the movie. Well, more so the novel Solaris, but, um, 
you know, uh, it's it's the overarching method uh, or method, sorry, is that uh, essentially, if we were to contact aliens, it might not even be or come into, come into contact with them. It, communication with them might be impossible because um, you know, think about how hard it is to um, communicate with someone. Uh, who speaks no English at all, and it's just you and them, there's nothing really to give you reference. Um, you can probably still get something communicated, but it'll take a lot longer, it'll be a lot harder. Now, multiply that by who knows how many thousands of colds, and that would be like alien intelligence. And so, I'd say um, uh, a similar thing would apply to God, and I'm not uh, uh, saying that God's an alien, I don't even believe in God, um, I'm open to the idea, but, um, I have not seen any evidence of that in my life as of yet, um, not for lack of trying, um, you know, I've done DMT hundreds of times, Kundalini Yoga, Ritual Magic, fucking prayer, all, like, all, all this, all this stuff, um, but, you know, uh, maybe it's just dopamine and serotonin deficits, but, uh, I don't get, uh, any semblance of, uh, you know, flirting with something supernatural. But this figure is, um, he's, he appears like a, a human, and he's called the sampler. And so, it's very hard to describe what he does, but from what I can tell, he keeps these pigs. And these pigs um, are attached to people. I told you, this is hard to describe. He seems to get some joy from taking samples of sounds of worms um, in the ground under his, his pigs. Um, and uh, when he goes by the pigs and sort of kneels down, he can get, like, like it's like he's a fly on the wall in these unfolding scenes of trauma in the lives of people who are attached to these, these surrogate pigs, if you will. Um, now, he is uh, responsible for the character who starts the narrative. Um, well, he's not directly responsible for him, but he is either willingly or unwittingly giving the guy what he needs to do what he does. Um, this guy is called the Thief. I like to call him the Orchid Thief because that sounds like it would be a cool name for a band. Uh, um, he, from what I can tell, is um, like a horticulturalist or something. And um, he has this group of kids who I don't know are volunteering for him or something. And um, he uh, uses water from the stream where the sampler drowns the baby piglets of the pigs he has um, and they uh, decay and all this kind of psychedelic colors, uh, these colors just um, are emitted from uh, the, the slowly putrefying um, piglets in the stream and so uh, causes this material to build up on his, his orchids and uh, at first you can see it's kind of a purple when he takes it off the orchid. Um, and these maggots develop underneath his plants. And the maggots have these intoxicating effects on people. Uh, some of it seems kind of like, uh, like Spice and Dune, where it's like, like the kids show how they have this ability to like move in this crazy karate style sort of thing but it's like very innocent they're giving each other high fives instead of punching each other or whatever um uh with their eyes closed it's a very very cool scene um very well choreographed um and they talk about how the water um that the maggots are uh submerged in is the best thing in life the best thing they could ever have um now, I put my pessimist cap on when I started hearing stuff like this, um, because although I think this movie is meant to... Shut up.
just meant to leave you with a... Huh. Look at that. Thank you. Um, it's meant to, uh, uh, like the, so, what, what sets off the, the story is, um, uh, I'll get into my pessimistic interpretation after, actually. Um, but, you know, I highly recommend watching the movie yourself if you haven't watched it already. It is an art house film, so it may not be for most people. But I would say if I had to show one person who's not into art house cinema or just doesn't know about it, an art house film, I would show them this because it's only an hour and a half long and it's very well done. Like the score he made for it is amazing. It's like almost more well known than the film itself, more sampled than used in the film itself um, by other uh, media since the film came out in 2012, I believe it was. Um, but this, uh, this orchid thief, he takes one of the maggots and he puts, or well he takes a couple, he puts some in capsules, just trying to get people to take them. They're just like, no, I don't want to take a weird ass fucking cap from this guy offering it to me outside a bar. And so he kind of just resigns himself, ah, oh, this isn't going to work. And then you think he's just going to fuck off or whatever, but he grabs this mask out of his truck and he forces one of the maggots down this woman's throat. And um, the woman is the, the the woman I was talking about earlier. She's kind of the star of the movie. Uh, Shank Ruth um, is alongside her. The main star is the film. Uh, if you had to choose some, as I said, there are players, but they're not really characters in the film. The players, um, they're crucial to the world building. Um, and to, uh, to the overarching, uh, messages in this, um, so we don't really get to know her much before she gets dosed by the orchid thief, um, now, when she's dosed by the orchid thief, it's very interesting, uh, there seems to be a scopolamine type effect to this, uh, this maggot, um, and, uh, like, she is in a highly suggestible, kind of slightly psychotic state. Um, she has these OCD tendencies. It's not clear if that was something she dealt with for her entire life, or something um, the orchid thief induced in her. I'm inclined to think the latter because she is given a copy of the book Walden by Louis Thoreau, which is um, a book about Thoreau. Uh, I haven't read it myself, but I looked it up um, after seeing this movie, and um, it seems to be about uh, Thoreau becoming Thoreau, sorry, uh, becoming uh, disenchanted with uh, city life, and so he went out into the wild with like nothing and just built a cabin and sort of lived off the land. Uh, had you know small farm sort of thing going on enough to sustain himself and he just wanted a couple of years in isolation to sort of have a renewed perspective on society and um, <clears throat> there were various uh, elements that he learned about the human condition by doing this um, I'm not going to go over them because a I've only read the uh, summary of this book um, and uh, also, from what I can tell from re after reading the summary, uh, the notions hinted at in the film are very much synonymous with what is more overtly said in this nonfiction book. Um, so the Arca Thief gives it to her and gets her to like write down some of the passages and um, she sort of just like is talking to herself and completely out of it and he's getting her to sort of like if you've seen videos of people dosed with scopolamine um like there's cctv videos of people being dosed um with that stuff and it's a delirium that makes people highly suggestible um and people will do stuff like um oh hey uh, uh buy me a drink and they'll be like okay and they'll pull out their wallet and then they'll be like oh yeah 
here, um, actually, I'll pay for it. Give me your wallet. And then they'll be like, oh, you'll pay for it? Great. And, like, it, it, he does stuff like that. These sort of misdirection uh, uh, techniques that are probably just as crucial to robbing someone when they're in that state as um, the drug itself. Um, and so, of course, she wakes up. She has no idea why her credit cards are maxed out. Uh, she's cashed all these checks that she de doesn't remember signing. Um, uh, and yeah, needless to say, she's just kind of fucked. She gets fired from her job as a result. She just kept her home the entire time. Um, and uh, she meets Shane Carruth's character, who um, is, he's more tenuously linked to this, but the dynamic between them is super interesting. It's like watching two individuals experiencing ego death together, and then sort of breaking this loop they're caught in, and um, figuring out what they can despite like their grasp on reality becoming less and less cohesive. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, the female character is um, turned over to the sampler at some point and he um it's a really crazy scene uh he has this uh tent set up and there's this massive device i don't even know what it is and it's casting sound back and forth um i guess it's meant to pick up the sound during um this uh operation he proceeds to do where he pulls cuts her open while she's asleep um takes the maggot out and puts it in a pig and that attaches her to the pig. Um, now, uh, her and Karuth, um, as I said, their identities both dissolve into each other. Like they start doing things like, uh, uh, there's one instance where um, I believe Karuth's telling a story and he's like, oh, my friend John and uh, we did, and then she's like, wait, no, that was my friend as a child, my friend in my childhood, that, that was my story, that happened to me, and it's just, I'm like, oh, you know, they're very confused, and they're trying, like, they, they have this attachment to each other, that seems like they resist, but, like, eventually kind of give in to, um, even though, like, at first they, they don't seem interested in each other, they, like, fight even kissing, um, and then just do it anyways, <clears throat> which is like, you know, I, I don't think that's a, a, a tool, um, that's been utilized to, uh, build up the chemistry between them, which I do think there is chemistry between him and her, I mean, they did get married after all, but then, you know, as long as, I won't get into what happened after they got married, but, um, uh, Suffice it to say, uh, they had good on stream, uh, on, on stream, um, upstream, uh, they had good chemistry and upstream color. Fuck, can't talk. <clears throat> now it would help smoking more fucking weed. Um, but, uh, like, uh, it's clear that they're both programmed in certain ways and they're unsure of their own programming. Um, Like, uh, as things go on, they sort of become more and more uh, paranoid and eventually just barricade themselves in their house. Um, and uh, eventually, um, they go through what I kind of would describe as the self-actualization process of taking all the clues left behind, despite being in states of, um, like, almost dissolution of identity uh they use the book walden and the passages she wrote as well as her ocd habit of uh diving to the bottom of this pool picking up a rock and bringing it to the top which is a clear reference to you know diving into the psyche pulling up traumas bringing them up to the top it so to me through the lens of like you know someone who's uh, done a couple uh, semesters of psychology anyways, um, 
although I've learned more about uh, especially psychodynamics um, from places other than university. Um, university in my experience was very, very overrated, but um, that was just the one I went to. I can't speak for all of them. But, um, like, uh, what makes them um, realize they are trapped in this cycle, um, even if they can't really articulate it very well, um, they, there's like, like, there's a, compared to Primer, there's almost no dialogue in this film. A lot of what's conveyed is conveyed through body language and imagery. Um, like, that's why I, I kind of describe it as the yin and yang of, uh, I think this would be the yin, the, the, the white part, um, the, the good, um, the, the love, the seeing the beauty in the universe primer was a bit more cynical, it was very rigid, it was very technical, um, and they used that amateur budget, I think, to make it look, um, uh, you know, like the things that, the, the words, uh, the descriptors I just used, um, but uh, yeah, the inciting incident is uh, the drowning of her piglets, um, her pig's piglets, which of course she does not know about. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is probably the most disturbing scene in the movie, but uh, it's also the most important because it shows that this is a cycle that's self-perpetuating and has probably been going on for a while. I mean, he clearly has other pigs with other people attached to them. Uh, the orca thief knows the process of, like, like you know, he'll scrape the leaves of his plants to see if that colored powder comes off. But um, he drowns her piglets, the sampler, the sampler, and I'll be specific, the sampler, the godlike character who's having these weird sh Schadenfreude moments of going down by these pigs and seeing, you know, uh, having a glimpse into all the moments leading up to a traumatic breakup in someone's life. Um, and he's just kind of like, yes, oh, sweet suffering. Like, I would say he's like a malicious god, um, but um, he could also, as I said, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to understand the mind of God, you know, uh, obviously. Um, so uh, he could be doing at all for the right reason. Like, he's very hard to figure out motive-wise. Like, I'm still not entirely sure what the purpose of the samples um, provide, um, other than maybe, like, a catalog of someone's life, um, but through the lens of, like, a literal different species, because I think the worms are all that he records under the ground like he also records the pigs too but um uh i think they're this like the same or similar to the maggots that had these like mind altering life altering uh properties um <clears throat> but yeah so he drowns her piglets she feels this immense rush of grief um and uh like she's just sobbing she's in pain you know like a mother who just lost you know their four children in the house fire or something but she, the thing is, she doesn't know why. She has no idea. And so, um, she, uh, I think starts, like, having, like, menstrual bleeding and goes to the hospital. And they're like, uh, yeah, it looks like, um, like they're, they're doing an ultrasound, I think, and, uh, like an MRI, I believe. And they say, it, it, like, it, she, at some point in her life, has surgery on her womb, um, it looked like it was a corrective surgery for some sort of tumor, um, but she said that never happened in her life, and uh, so now she's like just smacked over the head with this grief of never being able to have children, even though she never talked about wanting them. But you know now she can't even have that talk, um, and this is what kind of makes her snap and go, you know, "Fuck this circuit that is." running my life and um that i don't understand at all and so uh, 
through the process of uh, like the self-actualization where she's like remembering things that happen as she's um, going through the Walden quotes and the swimming uh, uh, ritual um, with Shane Kruth's help <coughs> uh, they start to understand things a little bit um, and then kind of inexplicably the sampler this godlike character he sort of just shows up to take his penance like he uh i think i think what happens is he sticks some guys on shane Caruso's character after he gets fired <coughs> and uh he just like beats the shit out of him um but uh then the godlike character shows up and He's completely unprotected, and he may be a godlike character in this universe, but he's also a human being, so he's not fucking invincible. Um, and uh, he doesn't really say much of anything, from what I can recall, uh, but the characters then essentially follow him to the farm, shoot him, kill him, um, and then uh, they send copies of Walden and I'm assuming instructions on how to self-actualize to all the people attached to the pigs, the other pigs this guy has. And then it's, it leaves on a happy note of them, um, this is them breaking the cycle essentially. Um, uh, and oh my god, this gave me so many uh, philosophy boners, this movie. Um, yeah, you can quote me on that. This movie gave me several philosophy boners. And I'll tell you why in just a sec. So, <clears throat> the movie ends with them, like, kind of, uh, deciding to live the rest of their life out in the wild, uh, well, uh, rural, um, you know, this farm where they're gonna take care of these pigs who, um, you know, they had no say in being put under anesthesia and implanted with these people, um, or at least being surrogates for these people, um, something that, uh, you know, the, they are obviously both affected by, kind of like, uh, like, you know, the whole, uh, quantum entanglement, um, notion of, you know, to, as I said, Shane Kruth is, like, he is at least, like, a PhD mathematician, pretty sure he also has, like, like, engineering, physics, maybe chemistry degree, certainly sounded like he did when he wrote Primer, because there's a lot of, like, chemistry, um, nomenclature that just went right over my head, but, um, mm, that was some delightfully strong fucking weed, uh, yeah, so, um, they, uh, break the cycle, they live there, they're letting the pigs have piglets, um, so I'm assuming this is going to reverse some of the physical damage, I hope, and it ends kind of with the orchid thief, um, like, he's, he's looking very frantic, um, one of the kids brings up a plant to him, he looks at the leaf, tries to scrape off some of that powder he was finding before, didn't see any, he shakes his head and he starts kind of crying a little bit. Upstream color. Like seriously that part, that theme from the, the movie with the really deep groaning scent. It's so eerie. Um but yeah, I mean it's uh like it's one of those things that kind of Shane Cruz said, uh, you know like Naked Lunch only in the sense, um, it's not like Naked Lunch in just about any other way, um, you can read it, uh, or, sorry, watch it, um, in this case, uh, in any order, uh, and the scenes, uh, should still make a cohesive narrative that is about the same, and so those are, like, the surface level aspects of the film. Um, my, uh, my pessimism-tainted brain, if you will, um, it's sure, uh, um, 
you know, at first I, I couldn't really say anything remotely negative, and I, I, I would say nothing negative about this movie as a criticism. I think this movie is, is about as perfect as it gets. Um, you, uh, if, you're, if you're someone who has been like inclined to watch uh, really, really technical directors um, from a young age, like, you know, uh, wh when I first started smoking pot, the thing we'd do is we'd watch Stanley Kubrick films back to back. Um, this guy's ripped as possible and much the fuck out watch. 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, you know, even Barry Lyndon, fucking uh, Clockwork Orange, of course, Full Metal Jacket. Like, um, always, always um, have been someone who um, is profoundly moved by film. And I think it can be one of the more thoughtful and relatable mediums. Um, and, uh, Upstream Color is definitely not a film that I think everyone would like just because of the unconventional format. Um, like, as I said, the narrative is obvious in how it's conveyed, but it doesn't make sense in, you know, uh, like, like a, a, a literal reading. It's not supposed to. I think it's supposed to be a surreal film, um, so it's um, essentially allegory. And um, I think Shank Ruth is right that there is a, a aspect of breaking the cycle. And um, as I said, um, you know, it's heavily hinted at that they self-actualize, and um, you know, it could be this god character is like a super ego. Um, or an ego, um, and, uh, like, they're already detached from their egos, I think, because, you know, they're, um, attached to these pigs. Shank Ruth's character's, um, attached to one of these pigs, and he experiences sensations of isolation from being, uh, separated from the other pigs all the time, um, that translate into his life as a human. Um, and so, uh, I mentioned determinism. Determinism is a huge aspect of this film. That's what, you know, like when you think of a cycle, um, something that happens largely because of um, a pre, almost predestined, um, like, expectation of events, you know, where things go generally according to, you know, <clears throat> if it's a cycle, what's happened before. Um, and uh, it, uh, uh, determinism, um, it being determinism, uh, is something that uh, talks a lot about um, uh, just the, the tenuous nature of our, uh, our identity, um, how much of ourself is ourself, um, and this is something that uh, really makes, like, hardline pessimists like me, um, determinist by default, um, I would say that I am about 50-50 inclined to believe that the self exists, or the self doesn't exist at all, and it's just an illusion, <coughs> conjured for several reasons, which I explained in other videos, so I won't get into it here, but, um, you know, the self, uh, the, the eyes of the characters in the film are not uh, um, given full agency, um, like the effects of the worm on the woman very clearly uh, have put her in such a suggestible state, like she isn't aware of anything going on except for very basic rituals in life. And um, I think when we're under a lot of pressure, like an abusive and emotionally and physically abusive relationship, um, this is a call forward to if I do talk about Shane Ruth um, and what happened to his career, but um, I'll stick to the movie for now. Um, like, 
you know, there's there's cycles in abuse. There are, are situations where we're put under someone's thumb. It could be something that is actually like a, like I, I read reports of people who have been dosed with scopolamine. Uh, as I said, I've seen CCTV footage. It's very similar to that. But I think um, it's uh, showing you the various levels of detachment that um, people can uh, engage in to uh, uh, in uh, Zappos terms um, isolate and distract themselves from reality to cope with their programming and their lack of any self uh, like the qualities of self that, uh, that hold merit and um, tangibility uh, and that uh, we experience more suffering than pleasure for the mo most part at least for people like uh, like us um, most pessimists ha you know tend to have a great deal of medical issues um, which you know I, I would say is very much um, something indicative of there being a prejudice, but I'm also someone who is uh, like willing to admit I'm wrong under the right circumstances. I'm willing to make the concession that I would not be misanthropic if I saw more of the world. But right now I can't because I am chemically chained to uh, you know, pharmaceutical uh, drugs that are highly physically addictive. Um, and that are destroying me, and it's, you know, that's a, that's a link in my life that controls so much of it, and, um, like, in this film, I like to think of the, the sampler as a, a god character, I don't think everyone who's seen this movie from the other analysis videos I've watched, um, consider that character kind of like, like god, um, I think, uh, the other players, like the Orca Thief, um, are almost as instrumental. I think they're, um, since each player is necessary for the cycle to continue, they are equally important in that regard. But, um, like, like, uh, it's clear if the piglets aren't drowned and the, um, chemical doesn't form on the orchids and, uh, worms don't, uh, the maggot things don't, uh, form, um, and that means, uh, the sampler can't, uh, kidnap these people and take the maggots out and, uh, put them in some pigs and then record the pigs and have these weird, like, m like, moments of, uh, revelry when being around them, uh, like, he might just be um, as human as the as other characters. Like, he does look as human as the other characters. He does die uh, from, like, a, a single gunshot, I believe. Um, so, you know, he, he has qualities of a human being. He could just be that, but he seems to at least be um, fucking lost. Fuck off. Fuck off. Trying to talk about a fucking very dense movie, boss. You are fucking that shit up now. Fuck you. God, I hate those fucking things. They're so aggressive right now. I've been stung like at least five times in the last three days. Um, give me an excuse to have another smoke because that way I can fucking blast him with the smoke if he comes back at me. Yeah, fuck. God damn it! Fucking thanks. Shut the fuck up on me. This this thing is gonna work out. Okay, I'm gonna. This is this is uh, like a huge benefit from um, being a smoker. As soon as that fucker comes for me next, I'm just gonna blow a puff of smoke at it, and it will like throw its fucking internal GPS into fucking just haywire. Like, uh, you know, nicotine just fucks up there. Uh, ability to navigate, so they just go. Mm, 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 mm. Um, yeah, sorry. Where was it? It fucking gave me a fright. Um, 
I think I've explained why I have PTSD around wasps, and, you know, I still get stung by them all the fucking time. Um, anyways, um, sorry, fucking that, that woke me the fuck up. Um, like, that thing creeped up under the table a couple times, just like when I thought it had flown off the other way. <sighs> okay, um... So, like, this guy, um, like, he seems representative, at least, of, like, if he is a god, he is a malicious god who takes pleasure in the suffering of the people attached to these pigs. Um, and, uh, I think he engages in what Zappa would call, um, distraction. Um, but, like, he doesn't seem to view reality um, like anyone else in the story. He doesn't act like he's dependent on anything, um, even though he's clearly dependent on his pigs, um, and the people inside them. Um, he has this sort of swagger to him that is like, uh, like, you can even compare it to Alanis Morissette and, um, playing God in, uh, Dogma. Like, only like truly good film on Kevin Smith has ever made in my opinion. Other than um, uh, Red State, Red State was pretty good. Um, but uh, anyways, um, yeah. So I think as a pessimist, this isn't as happy a story as we may think, um, because uh, like. When it ends, you sort of see the characters all get this copy of Walden. Uh, the characters who we haven't seen because we've seen their pigs, but we haven't seen them. Uh, and they all show up on this farm, and so it's implied they're all going to live there and take care of things. And things will be, like, go on happily ever after. Um, you know, they don't have lives for the most part to go back to anyways, because presumably they've all been robbed in a similar fashion. Um, by the orchid, orchid uh, thief, um, and uh, he's just called the thief again. Um, I, I call him the orchid thief because, because, yeah, as I said, I think it would make a badass name for a band. But, uh, in any case, uh, so they all show up, some of them are just in business attire at this fucking farm, um, and uh, yeah, like, I think while the story itself is mostly happy, and I think Shane Cruz probably intended for it to be, like, a liberating, uh, um, sort of parable about, um, all of these different ways in life in which we are sort of subjugated to something, you know, like I am to these pharmaceutical drugs, like, where I, I have no choice in them being a fundamental part of how I shape my my day-to-day, -day. um, because, uh, you know, the dependence on them means I can't stray very fucking far. Um, you know, I, I, if I don't take, you know, two doses of Valium every day, then fucking I will have fucking seizures if I miss a single dose, like, it's fucking, that, that's an extreme example, but, um, like, I, after reading Jack Parsons, uh, philosophical writings, I, I believe that, um, like, romantic relationships are uh, traditional, uh, uh, concepts like marriage are, um, like, very similar, like, they are means of anchoring ourselves in someone else, um, under the assumption that we can better their lives, they can better our lives, we're a perfect fit for one another, and, uh, you know, they potentially even have kids in this wonderful climate where the planet's just, like, literally burning, and, uh, and even in the first world, it's fucking burning, like, literally, um, or it's burning metaphorically in other places. Put it this way, the planet seems like a sinking ship, and I don't know why anyone would want to bring a child up in this fucking climate. I'm sorry. I think that's, um, like, unethical, and, uh, it's giving in to biological tendencies, um, because what are we but 
meat puppets who are programmed to procreate. You know, this movie obviously references how this woman's right to have children was taken away from her. Um, it's not uh, really indicated when this tumor and surgery happened. I'm assuming uh, around the time that, oh, you know what? It was probably when they took the worm out of her. Yeah, that's right. Um, but the, you know, the doctor just triaging it said that's what it looked like, a surgery to remove the tumor. So her reproductive rights were taken away from her. But in a way, she became liberated as she, um, you know, reunited with this pig, and the pig obviously can have piglets, they just all have been killed so far, um, and, uh, can, you know, whether she cared or not before, um, you know, there's an obvious, uh, uh, you know, message, subtle message, because there's more, uh, uh, weighty, important messages in this movie, but one thing is, you know, um, taking things for granted, you know, you don't know what you have until it's gone, sort of thing, um, you know, because, as I said, you don't get much of a glimpse into her life, uh, before she gets dosed, but she never really talked about being interested in motherhood or anything like that, um, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, we are animals, and animals, uh, are the staples of our diet, is to eat, sleep, fuck, fight, oftentimes, um, but as human beings, we have the Maslow's hierarchy of, you know, fundamental needs to, uh, make for, like, a, a, a stable mindset, um, but, uh, this film, well, um, it shows this liberation from the characters and then breaking this oppressive cycle, um, that was obviously being perpetuated by bad actors, which is a good thing, um, on the surface level. <sighs> I felt very unsure about, um, what these people would do after the fact, after they've seized this farm, after they've got over the honeymoon period of being en enlightened with their, um, counterparts, um, you know, what are the odds that these dozens of people sharing the space on this farm are going to enjoy farm life, um, even if that means being closer to their, their self. Um, you know, they still are puppets because they, unless they kill the pig and take the maggot out of it and maybe ingest it again, I don't know. Um, or put it in a different pig, like, they're not gonna, you know, live forever, exactly. Maybe the pig, uh, I mean, it's not implied these are super pigs or anything, they're just regular pigs that, like, uh, aren't even really aware of the lives that are planted within them, they still just act like pigs. So, um, I assume, uh, that nothing really changes for them, so they would die. Uh, you know, the, they'd have a lower mortality rate than, um, uh, people, so does that mean when they die, the maggot dies, um, unless transplanted and, uh, the person dies too? Um, I don't know. Um, the, the rules for that weren't really established, um, you know, but that, I think, is a great aspect of the film, that it makes you ponder this made me ponder what the after effects of all this would be, um, because yeah, like, like, they still are not wholly themselves, they are sharing things with a surrogate, and when those pigs die, does that mean that they are going to experience this intense grief, um, like the woman did when her piglets were drowned, um, and they're gonna have to do this multiple times, because again, pigs don't, as far as I know, live very long. Um, and also, what are they gonna do to support themselves financially? Um, you know, there could be an argument made that they have shed themselves of all the social burdens that come with, you know, the social contract. Um, you know, walked away from their jobs, fired from their jobs or whatever, left the city, they're all on this farm. 
well, what do they have to eat? Fucking pigs. What are they going to sell? Um, they gonna just got some crops growing overnight. And, you know, again, this isn't a, a world that is, um, like this world is, as the title suggests, more fluid than ours. Um, but it has, <coughs> you know, the same sort of, like, like, like basic ground rules as our world. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole cycle, I think, is representing uh, the various types of programming in our lives. Um, and the absurd way in which we oftentimes are forced to find ourselves once again. Hold on two seconds. I have shit to do today, believe it or not, um, but, uh, so, uh, in any case, um, yeah, like, like, what is going to become of them, um, they are still products of, you know, they obviously, uh, it's implied they existed before, um, they became, you know, attached to these pigs, and, um, to be these kind of perverse um, possessions of this sampler and victims of the orchid thief and um, all of that, like those things are still going to influence them and those things still created the people they became. Um, and uh, to me, uh, uh, as much as I, I can tell this movie is intended, like Terrence Malick's films, to make you appreciate the universe is like, you know, it's a it's a film that's very easy to appreciate. Um, it is a filmmaker's film, and I'm not a filmmaker. Um, this is about as close as I come. I do know how to edit stuff. I've made like many documentaries, but um, that was on a Mac. I could probably figure out editing pretty easily, but. Um, this is my format. I do stream of consciousness style videos. Um, uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, you kind of got to take it or leave it because it's me being me, and I refuse to be anything other than that. I'm not saying that editing would do that, but um, I don't. Know, I I find this format works best for me, I'll put it that way. Now, um, as for the implications of this film, um, I'll smoke the rest of this fucking train. Um, like, uh, it is, yeah, on the, overall, just in general, like, it's very beautiful. The way it's filmed is so detailed. The way it's scored is like hyper attentive. Like I can tell, Shank Ruth is a genius. He is a tortured genius. Um, you know, I think I'll do a separate video where I get into kind of what happened to his career. Like, um, you know, he wrote some very, very, very good scripts. Um, he was being supported by some very, uh, at least, people kind of shouted out by very big directors like David Fincher, Steven Soderbergh, but, um, yeah, it was just refused creative control for, um, stuff like a topiary, and he did have the opportunity to make a topiary instead of upstream color, and as much as I love upstream color, a topiary sounds like, um, there just would have been more going on, um, I believe you do see one of the creatures from a topiary in upstream color at the beginning. It's like this weird looking uh, robot thing that looks like it's put together with these like CG pieces, like CG printed pieces. Um, like a topiary is a whole other uh, can of worms to get into. It is very complex, but um, suffice to say those creatures are essentially um, 
these pieces made by this machine um, in a topiary that can create living creatures, essentially. Um, now, um, an upstream color, like, there really feels like no uh, moment that is, is unnecessary. Every little thing in there, it seems like it is meticulously sewn in. Like, if it sounds like I'm nerdgasming for this film, it's because I am. Um, I very much am. It is probably the most um, uplifting and um, downright amazing uh, experience I've had with the film uh, over the last little while. And I saw Oppenheimer in a VIP theater where you, like, it has the, like, the theaters rigged with the best sound system so, like, you can feel the effect. Um, and I still felt like, eh, that's kind of meh. Um, an upstream color I watched on just my computer screen, which is like I was begging um, the Lola to just drop a plasma screen into my fucking room because I really wanted to watch it on a bigger screen. But uh, it was like still so good, and I'm glad I have a good speaker that like picks up bass because um, this film has a lot of texture audio-wise, like, you know, he scored it, he also did all the folly effects and stuff. Like, Shane Carruth is, like, obviously someone who, um, he doesn't want all hands on deck. He wants, um, well, I mean, he does, but he wants those hands to be his hands. Um, he wants to be in full control of his vessel, and I understand that completely as, um, you know, a, a wannabe artist who has, like, a like, I have a bunch of stories I've written under my belt and stuff, i barely shown to anyone, because I mostly just write them for myself, um, I, I see what happens to people like Shane Carruth, I see how celebrity, um, makes people miserable and makes them shells of their former selves, like, if I was ever to publish something and it was to get any significant um, traction, I would want to do it under a pseudonym. Um, you know, like, I've seen how the people in succession live. Fuck that. Um, like, uh, interestingly, this movie doesn't seem to have many aspects of technology, if any, in it. Um, like, it is a movie that is um, meant to have an organic feel to it, um, because it is about uh, a lot of our organic processes, and a lot of the organic processes, phenomenons that we're not even aware of. This seems to be a, a theme that uh, Kruth is interested in. Like, he is always, first and foremost, to fucking watch that. Um, he's, he cares about the human stories, um, even in Primer, like, it's about two friends growing apart, um, even though there's, like, multiple different versions of them being formed from using the time machine again and again and again, and each one that's formed seems more devious than the last and knows more than the last, um, and, uh, Shane Carruth, uh, had a big falling out with Hollywood. So he posted a uh, primer on YouTube. You can watch it for free. I highly, I, like, I couldn't recommend it enough. I would admit, though, that it's not most people's cup of tea. It is very heady. It does not dumb itself down. I couldn't understand a lot of what was being said, but um, I could follow the story. And, um, like, Adam from uh, Your Movie Sucks, um, I think, personally, he is... Uh, the most grounded um, film critic on YouTube, and a lot of people uh, criticize him of being like deliberately contrarian, and I completely disagree. Uh, he is the six out of ten guy because he's like he'll talk about movies like he's praising elements, and then just be like, "Yep, six out of 10. Um and he assigns that uh, seemingly um, more than any other number on that scale chart. Um, uh, 
but he has done brilliant analysis of stuff like Schenectady in New York. Um, and uh, he, uh, um, you know, he, he brings up Primer very briefly in um, uh, his Looper criticism. And Looper is one of those time machine movies I can't take seriously. Like, I just can't take any time machine or time travel movies. Like, maybe some of Man in the High Castle, seriously, but, um, uh, because it's sort of a different level of travel, um, a different type of travel, even, uh, even though, like, time is a factor, uh, and it's not as in, like, this story isn't centered around time travel. Like, it's not the, the biggest narrative device. Uh, like, Looper was, um, uh, actually, uh, like, the, like, the script was sent to Shane Carruth, and he was like, this doesn't make any sense. And so, uh, Ryan Johnson or whatever, like, uh, he hired Carruth to come and to add some scenes that he would write, and they would film to make the story somewhat cohesive and not just full of fucking plot holes. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was essentially dismissed because it was too expensive to shoot. Um, not like that movie had unnecessary scenes that didn't go anywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, uh, upstream, or sorry, I just, I just gotta finish what I was saying about Adam. Um, so he was talking about how he had seen Primer seven times and he still does not understand it. And if anyone gets movies more than me, it's him. And I admit, there are aspects of it I still don't understand. The most puzzling of which, um, and if you've seen the film, you'll know what I'm talking about, is, um, like, when they're doing the whole, like, we should test this and punch my boss in the face to see what happens, um, his, I, his boss, or his, like, stepfather or something, I believe they might be one and the same, um, uh, stumbles out of this car, uh, that he, like, he's just following them around, and so they get out to confront him, and he stumbles out, and he's got this big, like, like, beard, untrimmed hair, and just looks like a mess, they know he's used the machine, um, and they, like, sedate him, and I think they, like, uh, uh, like, eventually kill him, um, like, very discreetly, um, but, it's like, whoa, what the fuck, how did he get, even get close to having access to this machine that has created this, like, in a, what, in my opinion, and, and this is debatable, um, it's created just a closed off time loop. Uh, now, um, if Adam would say that about Primer, um, like, that says a lot about how, in, like, inscrutable some of Shane Carruth's movies are. But the thing is, Upstream Color, it isn't as technically baffling as um, Upstream Color. As I said, it's like a yin and yang. Now, um, it's very unfortunate what happened with Shane Carruth's other projects. But, um, yeah, let me just see. Do I have anything else to say about Upstream Color? Um, I mean, I'm going to watch it again, and there will probably be more revelations. Just listening to the score, like, brings back, like, it turns on a projector in my head, and I start seeing scenes associated with it. Um, and as I said, it, um, it, it's an unconventional story. It's an unconventional way of telling it, but it's also very beautiful, like, very bright colors. Um, uh, like, there's a lot going on that you can go, I fucking relate to that, even though it seems like the cause is something, like, incomprehensible, uh, and something that wouldn't happen to us. But that's the thing, is, like, we have a tendency to go, oh, thing, like, you know, if I just focus my fear <coughs> in this direction on this thing or that, um, if I just, you know, if cigarettes kill you and I never smoke cigarettes, I'm never gonna fucking die. Um, you know, some people legitimately think like that. And, um, I have this term that I've come up with because I think it 
adequately describes so much of what Thomas Ligotti conveys in his fiction, which is like angry, pessimistic uh, cosmic horror fiction that is delightfully good. Um, one of the overarching things that he says is um, essentially to sum it up, life is a cruel joke punctuated by death and how death invalidates everything we did leading up to that. Because when we're a corpse, we're fucking useless. When we we're alive, we we're useful because we can be used for X, Y, or Z. Um, now, I think, um, like a lot of uh, upstream color hints at stuff like that. <clears throat> you know, if the sampler character is a god character, which in my opinion, he it is, um, maybe it's like a, a, a Gnostic god that when they kill it, it, like, cause he seemed to lead them to him, almost, uh, he seemed to intend for this to happen, um, uh, you know, that, I guess, is debatable, but, uh, it, that's how it kind of seemed to me, and, again, he's not described as a god character, this is my interpretation, because he seems to, um, have his sort of tendrils and everything, and, um, yeah, he can, like, literally experience other people's lives by just, like, like, kneeling by one of these pigs, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, like, can actually physically, um, alter these people, um, at, at least his process does, um, and, um, you know, maybe there's a Nietzschean element of, uh, I don't even know if that's a word, but, um, you know, where it's like the Ubermensch, because that Ubermensch notion, even though it was hijacked by Adolf Hitler and bastardized into, like, oh, the Ubermensch is the super soldier, the Aryan fucking, like, muscular Wolfenstein fucking enemy, uh, <coughs> But, I mean, Hitler ruined everything. The whole notion of the Ubermensch is fascinating. Like, this notion that we can somehow attain a level of existence where we are simultaneously grounded in reality, in touch with ourselves, and being able to experience the mind of God without the discipline that comes with going to fucking church. Like, I think that model fits into the story of upstream color very snugly so even though it seems like it might be an optimistic film it might have the feel of one <clears throat> i mean at least um just in in terms of the colors and the imagery there's a lot of dark subject matter as i've described um but uh <clears throat> Yummy, yummy. Um, like, yeah, maybe by um, killing him, they are completing this self actualization process. Because self actualization is basically the same thing Nietzsche described. A lot of things in psychodynamics, unfortunately, seem to me like, like almost like plagiarisms of concepts Nietzsche came up with, like muscle memory, um, the collective unconscious where he described uh, hereditary lineage leading up to who we are, which is like, um, you know, he was doing that in a philosophical concept or context, but I think that also makes sense in a functionalist um, sense because it describes how our ancestors evolved leading up to us. Um, mind you, human beings have been in a suspended state of animation for a long time, and I think we are regressing, if anything, because of how uh, servile we were becoming to stuff like technology. And um, this movie touches on things that take us out of this world, things that um, anchor us, um, you know, like even, even simple things like relationships. Like it's shown that the two characters in it can give in to this impulse 
to um, like engage in you know, like almost like voraciously sexual behavior, but they're stopping each other every few seconds when they're and then they'll start making out again and groping and whatever and they don't know why they're doing that but they're doing that and you know as I described there's this whole element of the woman you know without knowing she even wanted kids grieving for kids that she didn't know she even had um, and uh, so I think even though this this film seems to be about liberation um, I think they, and they go through the steps of becoming the Ubermensch, they kill God, um, and, uh, are now in touch with their self, have control over their self, but again, uh, with all the issues that I just posed, how much control, what are, what, you know, what's, what's the fine print, what, what are the potential uh, ramifications of being in the state like we look at people in history who claim to have had the mind of God um, like like especially in recent history most cult leaders uh, had that sort of mentality whether they believed it or not um, and uh, you know that led to dangerously arrogant reckless uh, behavior um, when you believe you're doing something on an almost divine authority and um, like you know there's no necessary necessarily uh, like religious tones to this film um, like Terrence Malick's movies it is a transcendental film um, it is a film intended to give you this revelatory experience that really binds you to the characters like they're bound to these pigs um that they don't even know exist for a long time um and uh yeah i think uh i think shank ruth is a brilliant guy like that soundtrack is so good you know this is a movie i'd say at least watch the trailer for it because the trailer doesn't give it away like if you've seen the movie you'll recognize parts of the narrative in the trailer but if you haven't i would suggest watching it because you at least hear the score too of that like deep bassy um uh theme that i was uh discussing and yeah just the the, the sound textures in this film uh they're really something the shots the way they carry over and show small things like you know someone looking into a sink from the tap and then like moving and like showing like an office or something. I think that was a shot anyways, maybe I'm just fucking, uh, my brain's conjuring something similar, but there's a lot of rolling shots that are very, very impressive. And it didn't have the cheesy elements of Tree of Life that I wasn't so fond of. Um, like this movie was, um, like it had some horrific elements like the piglets and the way the maggot is transported through this cycle through people um yeah there's disturbing implications throughout um but overall like it it, it gives off this like like general vibe of liberation um but as i just described in I hadn't fully like realized this myself but the like Nietzsche's notion of you know God is dead we need to kill God to become the Ubermensch um, you know and that we need to learn to live without religion to give us meaning in life you know which was something more relevant in his time obviously um, uh, I think it is still relevant in our time but it's um, taken up different forms back then it was just Christianity or you die <laughs> sort of thing um, but uh, uh, yeah like the, the and then the notion of the Ubermensch which is again synonymous with self-actualization very very um, similar to the uh, the themes in this film um, and the cycle of it um, now I believe you can still watch this movie and not think that I've spoiled it for you because this movie 
again, it's got such a fluid plot that you can watch the scenes in any order and it will still tell the same story, ultimately. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting to try that to see what story it does tell. Um, just maybe it doesn't. Um, but to me, yeah, I think that there are darker undertones to um, the film and the questions it left me with, but maybe that's just because I'm a fucking pessimist. Um, but, uh, hey, like, um, and pessimism is, is like the ultimate black pill once you, uh, realize how much it, like, accurately summates a lot of things in life, even if for the worst, um, it's like you can't stop seeing it in things. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, the agency of the characters is it's very questionable. Like, they're not shown to have much agency at all throughout the film. Um, like, they are engaging in rituals to reach the state of self-actualization. Um, and, um, you know, are they now criminals by killing God, by killing the sampler? Um, are they going to make li the lives of the pigs worse because they, you know, decide to one day fuck off or something? I think there's some very intriguing, lingering questions that this enigmatic film left me with. And, um... I really cannot suggest uh, this movie enough to absolutely everyone and anyone who can hold their attention span as long as this video, because this video is as long as that movie. Now, granted, it is one of those movies that's an hour and a half, but feels kind of like it's two and a half hours, um, because there's a lot of stuff that's being set up. There's a lot of stuff that's going on, but it's not something that, like most art house cinema, or not most, that's maybe a bit harsh, but a lot of art house cinema I've seen is full of unnecessary kind of flares, flourishes to go, look at me, aren't I a distinct, uh, definitive, ingenious director who's different than all those who have come before me. Um, this film does not do that. There are no pretenses in it. Um, I even find some Terrence Malick's films um, that are like that they're kind of self-indulgent in terms of the transcendental aspects of it. Um, maybe that would be less apparent to someone who's more inclined to transcendent, um, you know, experiences and imagery, and um, you know, I've been inclined to you know, like chemically induced experiences, um, intensely psychological, like LSD um, under the tutelage of my uh, psychologist, um, DMT, um, taught me a lot, but, um, I don't feel like it has meaningfully changed my life any more than these films have. Like, these films are, um, like, deeply introspective experiences. Like, the only thing that you need is to turn your brain on when you're watching. Um, and uh, for me, um, I can't turn my brain off when I'm watching something. Um, if it's, especially if it's something like that. There's, of course, I, I can watch true crime, that's kind of my, my junk food of the mind, um, where I'll just sort of space out, get stoned, fucking play video games, but even if I'm stoned as fuck, while watching something like upstream color, I am fucking in it, and I have my eyes open to see as much as I can. As I said, I've seen this film once. I watched the first 10 minutes of it, like, 10 years ago or some shit like that, um, and just, like, turned it off, um, but I will watch it again soon, but that, after letting it ruminate, after letting it kind of steep um, in my in my brain, like, it has really been a refreshing exercise, um, like, something just for, like, something cerebral for my, my mind to gnash on, and, uh, yeah, I hope that this will encourage other people to watch it, and I hope that people made it all the way to this point, because I think I actually, for once, did a fairly coherent job of describing something, except for the wasp chasing me around, 
um, but that probably added some um, some points. Um, so that was probably more interesting than everything I just talked about. Um, but anyways, uh, I gotta go because I got shit to do. So anyways, um, peace. Um, I'll see you uh, if I'm not completely plunged into fucking benzo withdrawal hell. Uh, soon, so. Bye. Bye now. Wow. <laughs>